Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin, and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. We, we began reflecting on the sacrifice of Christ, and I want to continue that thought this week as we look at the attributes and the accomplishments of our Lord's work on the cross. And I've tried to be more, um, what's the word, I guess preachy for the last couple of weeks to kind of help you relax and not be so teachy. But this week, we're going to need to work through the details of exactly what it is that our Savior accomplished at Calvary. And so it'll be a little more studious this week as we begin these thoughts. But let me just reflect back from everything that we covered really last week in, in two thoughts or, in, or in, in just a few passages here, we were talking about the sacrifice and the accomplishment of our salvation was solely because of the will of God. And we, think, we thought about that, we reflected on that hopefully for a very long time. The only reason that we had opportunity to be rescued from hell, the only reason that we had any chance whatsoever to be saved was because it was the will of the Father. Other than that, we would all be condemned for all eternity and God would be justified in His actions. But because of His will, salvation came through the sacrifice of His Son. But it wasn't just His will. We also saw that it was through the willingness of the Son. So we had the will of the Father and the willingness of the Son. And let me show you these in just a couple of points. It says, Therefore, when Christ comes into the world, He says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body, look what he says, you have prepared for me. This is what God did. From the foundation of the world, God prepared a body for his son. And we'll talk about why that's so important in just a few, minutes, a few minutes. But it was the plan of God. Acts 2 says it was the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God that Christ would be crucified. You need to, those are some thoughts that you really need to think on. Before there was ever a star in the heavens, before the sun, the moon, or earth, or any such thing, Christ was crucified in the mind of the Father so that you and I could be made right with Him. He goes on to say, In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, I have, Behold, I have come to do whose will? Your will, O God. Remember Jesus' prayer in the garden? Not my will, right? But your will. The Lord Jesus Christ was always the willing Son, accomplishing perfectly the will of God. Now let me walk back through and look at the willingness of the Son. Therefore, when He comes into the world, He says, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. And whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do one thing alone. The will of God. So you're sitting here this morning and you're resting in the fact that He holds you fast for two primary reasons. It was the will of God and it was the willingness of the Son. Apart from those things, we have no salvation. Now, you remember all that? Because we talked all about that last week. So let's get into this week. And I want to look at three thoughts this morning. The first thought, I want to talk about the form of the sacrifice. And that was it was bodily. Without Him having a body again, we could not be redeemed. And it's so important. After that, we'll talk about the character of the sacrifice. The sacrifice had to be holy. And then we'll talk about the result of the sacrifice, how gloriously accepted it was, this sacrifice of the Son. So we're going to talk about the body of Christ, the holiness of Christ, and how accepted He was. But first, let's think about the body. And we're going to spend time. It's a little unusual. I don't usually carry you out of the text. 
but we may be going to a few places this morning because I want us to reflect long on how beautiful it was that God laid aside his glorious robes and he gar- or wrapped himself in the flesh of mankind. First passage that came to mind, and I was just reflecting on these through the week, was Luke 2. He was born a virgin. You think about that for just a second. God was wrapped in cloths and was laid in a manger. The God who through the Father created everything in existence, created man, created the heavens and the earth, created that breath through Christ, that heartbeat that you feel in your chest. That God was born a baby, was wrapped in cloths, and was laid down in a manger, in a body of a man. I thought about the passage where his ministry begins in John 1, where he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Right? He became flesh. And then that's the first of John, but then the last of John. Without John 20 and without doubting Thomas, we would... It would be very difficult for us to bring these two thoughts together. But you remember what Thomas said. You know, unless I see the holes in his hand and his side, I will not believe. And in 27, Jesus says to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. God said, look at my hands. And then he says, reach here and put them into my side. God had a side. And Thomas reached and touched God. You remember what Thomas said after he did this? He looked at this man and he said, my Lord and my God. What a beautiful thing. We get the whole picture. We criticize Thomas, but without those words, you and I would be scrambling for some of that theology. But he puts this in perspective. He was a man. He was a real man. He was flesh and blood. And then 1 John, you can't forget this. 1 John is an old man. We've been reflecting on Wednesday nights, walking through that. And he said, what was from the beginning, what we heard. He then says, what we saw with our own eyes. And then he says, what we looked at, I touched. This was our God. I heard him. You can imagine hearing the voice of Jesus. We'll all get to hear him one day. John saying, I saw him with my own eyes. We'll get to see him one day face to face. And he said, then, believe it or not, I reached out and I touched God with my own hands. And one morning or one evening or one day, beloved, we will get to do all of those things because of what he did for us in a body. And these words are so prominent to the writer of Hebrews 2. Look what he says here. In Hebrews 2, he says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise also partook of the same. In verse 17, he says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. You need to realize when you saw Christ, you saw a man. Exactly. There was no difference when you looked at him. You were looking at God in the body of a man. I love Hebrews 9. You'll miss this if you're not careful. But when we see this word, how much more will the blood of Christ, he's referring to the death. Angels don't die. God doesn't die. Unless, of course, God became a man. Because who dies? Men die. And he was so much like you and I that he shed his blood and he died. He was a man. When you get to Hebrews 10, look what he says. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a what? A body you have prepared for me. In 10, 10, he says, by this will, we have been sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It was a body. You think about this. 
it was necessary for it to be a body. The blood of bulls and goats, like he says in chapter 10, verse 3, can never pay for the sins of man. It has to be a suitable substitute in order to pay for the sins of man. It has to be a man to pay for the sins of mankind. There was one representative and through his actions we were all condemned. That was Adam. And through one man's actions we were made holy. That was Christ. He had to be a man. God works by representation. But what man is holy enough to offer himself to God without sin to pay for sin? How many men were able to pay for sin? There was only one man. So he had to be a man and yet at the same time he had to be holy. He had to have a body. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Keep your pin there and go to Philippians chapter 2 and there's no telling how many times I've taken you here for the last three years but surely by now you have it memorized right Philippians chapter 2 look at verse 5 I want to paint a difference for you Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And verse 6 is one of the most glorious passages to me in Scripture. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. But he emptied himself in verse 7 taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of what? Men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Some theologians call this the humiliation of Christ. You think about this. He was, he is equal with God seated on a throne, having masses of angels that are innumerable around him, worshiping and praising him. And we will see shortly, there are those whose job for all of eternity, day and night, is to proclaim holy, holy, holy. That is their job. And yet this God did not consider equality with God the Father a thing to be held on to for his own gain. That's what that means. For his own selfish end, he did not cling to glory, but he removed glory and put on the robes of a man as a very lowly bondservant. And he came and was born in, they say, humiliation. Not just did he come as a man, but go back to Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah very quickly. About halfway in the old Isaiah chapter 53. Got overwhelmed with this thought this week and I just thought, my goodness. The difference, the great distance between who you were and what you became for us. Look at Isaiah 53. Let me begin in verse 2. The Bible says, Christ grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has, look at this, no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we would be attracted to him. Keep in mind who he was before he came. Okay, look at verse three. He was despised and forsaken, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Before he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He was the most esteemed. He was the most 
stately. He was the most majestic. He's the glorious one. But I have come not to do my will, but your will, O God. And now I have no stately form. I have no majesty. There's nothing about me that makes you look upon me with attraction. The difference between who he was and who he became for us, words just can't cover that distance. Y'all know how shallow we are. We want to look good. Some go to great ends to look good, don't they? To be attractive. I've got a friend right now. He's just making a fool out of himself. To be attractive. And I think how different that is than the mind and the heart of our Lord who became so unattractive, despised even, rejected, to go from being worshipped to being murdered. He had to come in a body. You know, when I thought about this, I thought about Luke 9, 23, and, and don't, don't turn there, but listen to this. What right does God have to say this to us? Listen to his words. Jesus was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny what he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profit if he gained the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What right does God have to say that? You want me to deny myself? You want me to lose my life? What right do you have to say those things? I thought, well, you got two rights. Number one, you're God. You can say what you want to say. You're the great I am. But the second reason is because that's exactly what you did. You denied yourself. You did not consider equality with thought God a thing to be grasped. You put on weakness. You put on flesh. You put on pain. You put on sorrow, two things God didn't know. You let yourself be killed, something God doesn't know about. You denied yourself. Yes, you can call me to deny myself. You have every right to do that. Not only are you God, but you... That's exactly what you did. That's the example you laid out for me in my life. You can say that all day long, and the only thing I should say is, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. You know how precious it is that He says it and He does it? You think about it with your kids. I demand... That my kids respect their mother. It is a demand in my house. And I can even say things that y'all said before. If you're going to live under my roof, right? You're going to respect your mom. But I don't just say it. I do it. I respect her. My kids have two reasons to respect their mom. They're going to live in my house. They're going to play by my rules. And if they're going to live in my house, they're going to follow my example and do what I do. You see, when Christ came in bodily form, He not just made a way for us. He not just offered Himself as a sacrifice to pay for my sin. He offered Himself as an example of how to live my life. He came like a man so I could watch a man deny himself and live in a way that glorifies and honors His Father. We have no right to walk around in this life claiming Christ and then living for ourselves. You don't have that right. And if anybody told you you had that right, they'd lied to you and you bought into a false gospel. This gospel says, if anyone wants to come after me, that's this gospel. 
You must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. You've been bought at a great price. He went from glory to the bondservant of men and then died. He has every right. But let me turn that, get it back positive for you. What does this mean for us? Let me think about this. What does this mean for us? Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. What God is going to walk off his throne and walk away from worship and praise and put on something that looks like me? I'll tell you what kind of God's going to do that. A God who loves me. And a God who loves you. You see how precious the body of God is. He didn't stand afar off and say, I love you. No, he said, I will go myself and I will make myself recognizable. I will be one of them. And then I will say, I love you. The body of Christ. What a difference that has made. Second thought. Let's talk about the character of the sacrifice. The form was a body. The character was holy. Let's talk about things we have no idea what we're talking about. Right. Holiness. A couple of passages came to mind. Second Corinthians five. He made him who knew what? No sin to be sin for us. Again, we've been going through first John. First John three, five says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And then John says, and in him there is no sin. He was absolutely perfect. Isaiah 53, we don't have to turn back there. Isaiah 53, 9 says, he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. First Peter chapter one says, we have been redeemed by precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. And then look what the writer of Hebrews says. 914, he says, Christ offered himself without blemish to God. Hebrews 10, he says, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with Here's the analogy, pure water, which is a reference to the holiness of Christ. Not to mention in Hebrews 4, you don't have to turn back, but he says, our high priest has been tempted with all things, yet is without sin. We really don't, we don't, really don't understand that. I mean, we're so <laughs> sinful, Right? Not just my actions, but my agenda, my thoughts, the center of who I am, apart from Christ, is sinful. And I cannot understand or comprehend the idea of holiness. We're not going to walk into heaven like we're strolling through life and lo and go, look, yeah, the streets are gold. Wow. That's cool. Isaiah gets an image, right? Listen to what he says. In Isaiah chapter 6, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, and two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord's host. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at his voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, woe as me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king. That's the idea of man coming before holiness. I'm ruined. This is too awesome. This is too unimaginable. This is overwhelming. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I just don't have words. He tries not to let you think it's him, but it was him who went into the third heaven. And he says, I saw things that men can't talk about. 
And then we have all these ignorant, stupid, sorry, Jonathan, little books about people spending 30 seconds in heaven or five minutes. It's foolishness. It's ignorance. It's blasphemous. You and I don't walk through heaven going, hey, Jesus. You look like John Denver. No. No, he does not. He is holy. And when John saw him in Revelations, he said, I fell down like a dead man. That's holiness. And I don't know, I don't think anybody's alive that's ever seen Christ in his holiness. Because I believe you'd be like Paul. Human beings do not have words to describe what I saw. I won't talk about it. That's the holiness of God. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. And I want us to look at this and then we'll move on. Revelation chapter 4, look at verse 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And look at this. Day and night, they do not stop, saying, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. That's holiness. It's so overwhelming that whatever these angelic beings are, that's their job for eternity. They never stop. And what's even stranger to me is I will be holy and that will fill me with joy. To hear the sounds of heaven as it never stops those angelic beings proclaiming holy, holy, holy. And it will fill us with such joy we will never tire. We'll be flooded with His glory. We're talking about things we don't know about. We're talking about things we don't, we've, we've never experienced you remember Moses when he was in the presence of God and he came out and his countenance was shining so they had to put a sack over his head because the people couldn't look at him. That's just getting close. And we'll get to share in that. It's a beautiful thought, but that's who our sacrifice was, right? So he was a body which proved to us that God was going to love man but our sacrifice is also holy. What does that teach us? That now man could be with God. Because through his holiness and through his sacrifice, that holiness now comes to us. And so we can stand before God. God says, I will relate to you. I will come in body. And how I will relate, I will relate to you in holiness and be a sacrifice so that you can be holy and relate back to me. He came in a body. He came in holiness in this last thought. He was so very accepted. Let's look at this for just a second. And we'll be finished. Hebrews 9, 26 says, Otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment. So Christ also having offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. There's a lot here. Let's pause for just a second. I wasn't going to, but let's stop for a second. It was so accepted that after the hundreds of thousands of sacrifices that we see in the Old Testament, it had to blow a Jew's mind to, to even consider 
there would be just one to pay for all sins for all time. That probably blew their mind to think about. You know how many animals we've had to kill since we received the law? Do you know how sinful man is? Probably millions of animals blood shed just to pay for sin. And you're going to tell me that by one sacrifice, that one offering is going to pay for sins for all time. Yes. 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 It paid for them all because it was accepted by God. Now in this, listen, this is what I want to pause and look at. There is no more reference. There is no more reference to sin for the child of God. And in this, we, we see the gospel. Look at this. Every preacher says this at a funeral. It's appointed to man to die once. Yes, it is. But the point of that is, is something they don't continue in, nor have I preaching a funeral. <laughs> Judgment. That's the idea. If you believe in death, and this is a good way to start a gospel conversation, do you believe you're going to die? Yes. Well, the Bible says just as certainly as there is death, there is judgment. If you believe in death, you have to believe in judgment. And if you believe in judgment, then you have to believe in the sacrifice for the sake of judgment. Because if you have received the sacrifice of Christ when He comes again... There is no more reference to sin. Sin has been so utterly removed from the sacrifice of Christ. And according to Scripture, that's just as certain as death itself. We die. We stand before God in judgment. And there's one, only one payment that has been accepted because there was only one sacrifice that God ever accepted and that was the sacrifice of his son. Look what he says in the next passage. By this will we have been sanctified in Hebrews 10. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which will never take away sins. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time set down at the right hand of God waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. That's the whole point of chapter 10. It just took one time. There's only one sacrifice that you can walk into the judgment of God and survive without being condemned to hell. And that is the sacrifice of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was once for all. How accepted was it? Go back to Philippians 2 for me. Philippians 2 verse 9. Philippians 2, verse 9. For this reason, for what reason? <laughs> the humiliation of Christ. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are on heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of the Father. That's how accepted the sacrifice was. And you think about this movement that our Lord makes through this gospel. He goes from being equal to God to being what we read in Isaiah. He had no stately or majestic appearance. We didn't even look on him as being much. And then he dies in our place and the Lord so highly exalts him that one day Every knee will bow 
and every tongue confess that you are Lord. And you think about that. And this morning, if you're in Christ, you can look at the person down on their knees next to you and go, that means he accepts the sacrifice. What he done has pleased the Father. And through that sacrifice, you and I have a way to God. Not only that, turn just one page or two pages and go to Colossians. Look at chapter 1. We'll start in verse 19. This is what that acceptance of that sacrifice means for you. Colossians 1.19 says, It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in the Son, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace, there's your acceptance, through the blood of the cross, through Him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you, this is us, were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet now He has reconciled you in His fleshly body, there's the body, through death, there's the sacrifice, and look why. In order to present you before God, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That's you in heaven. That's you because God accepted the sacrifice. When you stand there, I don't know how much of a mind that God will give us toward this life. But if it's any mind at all, we won't be able to stand with the realization that I have become or I have gone from being this sinful, God-rejecting, self-exalting sinner to standing before the holy of holies and being myself holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. We travel a great distance too through this cross. And we'll stand before Him just that way because that sacrifice was accepted. It's ridiculous what we have in Jesus. One more thought. Turn back just a couple of books to your left. The book of Ephesians. Let's look at where you are now because of the sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. That's where you will be, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Let's look at where you are. And you were dead, Ephesians 2, 1, in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all, in case you don't think you were included, formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We all by nature were children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And look at this. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ. There you are right now. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Where's Jesus right now? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Where are you right now in God's mind if you're in Christ? You are seated in Christ right next to God the Father. Even now. You know what Paul would say after he'd say that, bring that point to mind? Now live like it. Live like it. Because that's exactly where you are in Christ. Last week I closed with this thought and I'll close with this same thought. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies back to God as a living sacrifice. And look what He's already been accomplished on your behalf. 
You are holy. You are acceptable. The only thing that needs to be done is you need to offer your bodies day after day after day as a sacrifice to God. And then he goes on to say, that's worship. That's what worship is. God, I'm here. I'm yours. You have every right to claim rule and authority over my life. Do in me whatever you will. I'm your sacrifice. Bring glory to yourself. If you don't know Christ this morning, oh my goodness, you're missing everything. Absolutely everything. You will die. You will stand before God and you will be judged. And he will accept you in Christ. And he will not outside of Christ. If you are in Christ this morning, you need to offer your life to God every moment of every day. You've been made holy and acceptable. The only thing lacking is your offering. Let's pray.